Hi, I'm backstage at the Tivoli Theatre in Wimborne and I'm absolutely delighted to be with Frank Allen. And it's always a pleasure to see you, Guy. Good to see you again too, Frank. Frank, if I may say, you're a man of many talents, um, including, of course, a, an acclaimed author, also a guitar collector, a multi-instrumentalist, but of course for the bass player for the last 50 years has been really your, your main thing. But how did it actually all start for you, Frank? I mean, how did you get into playing music? I don't know about using? multi-instrumentalist. I okay. don't recognise that one. I did sort of um, fluff my way through some piano on stage for a while, and um, I do rhythm guitar very, very basically. So that's about as far as the multi-instrumentalist goes. Bass is my instrument. Right. How did it start for me? Right. Um, started when I first heard rock and roll. Vaguely Bill Haley, but it was really Elvis. Elvis came out, Elvis was playing a guitar, rock and roll happened, it was so romantic, the music was so exciting, I desperately wanted a guitar. And uh, eventually my parents bought me one, and I, like all the other kids around at the time, I learned a few chords, played a lot of skiffle, mm -hmm. gradually learned some more chords, and as things got better, the music got better, and it went into rock and roll. And I didn't realise, but it was eventually not going to stop, and it turned into the career that I have today. And of course, your first band of note was uh, the Re with the Rebel Rousers. Yeah. And um, how long were you with that band, and were you, you played bass with them, presumably? Roughly three years I was yeah. with them. I joined probably the mid middle of 1961. Before yeah. that, I'd had what well, little skiffle groups that I mentioned. I was in the Ambassadors Skiffle Group. Yeah. Then I had the Raiders Rhythm Group. Then we had little uh, semi-pro rock and roll combos. I had the, the Skyways, and which t sometimes was the Frank Allen combo. Mm -hmm. But then, yes, I joined the Rebel Rouse of 61. It was a band I'd always wanted to be in because I saw them in 59 mm -hmm. when they were only semi-pro. And mm -hmm. even then, with Cliff playing rhythm guitar and singing, and they were just amazing. I mean, so much more professional than anyone I'd ever seen around. So I always wanted to be in that band. And gradually I talked my way into it okay. in 61 because one guy had left mm -hmm. a band who used to be in my little group, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, you've always wanted to be in the band. The job's open. So I went and they, they decided they didn't need a rhythm guitarist, which was a bit of a blow. So I accepted that. Okay. And uh, but then about a week later, Cliff phoned me up and said, well he didn't phone me up because I didn't have a phone, he got in touch with me and said we're going to do our first Saturday club and we booked, and booked as a six piece band and now we've only got five so would you come along and just do the Saturday club? Yeah. So I jumped at the chance, said certainly would. Mm -hmm. The rest of the band went up in the Thames van to the Playhouse in Charankos Road, yeah. Cliff picked me up in his very nice shiny new Sunbeam Rapier wow. and so, between mm -hmm between um, Harlington yeah. and the Playhouse in Charing Cross Road, I talked Cliff into believing that he needed me as a rhythm guitarist and as a harmony singer. So yeah. by the end of the day, I was a rebel rouser. So I knew that once I convinced him yeah. that it was okay, the others did what they were told, more or less. So Congratulations, that, that's a great way to start. But then on the 3rd of August, I think I'm right in saying, uh, 1964, when Tony Jackson left The mm. Searchers, you, you actually joined the searches. Yeah, but I haven't even become a bass player yet. Uh, well, well okay. I had okay. by that time, but but I we mm. in the Rebel Rouses, I did start off as a, a rhythm guitarist. Mm. Then at Christmas, three of the group mm. left, and we needed a new rhythm, a new bass player, mm. sax player, mm. and uh, get, and lead guitarist. Mm. Well, eventually we found who we wanted in Nicky Hopkins on piano. We changed right. over the sax to mm. to a, a pianist and. Um, a guy called Bernie Watson on guitar. We couldn't get the bass player. Mm -hmm. So we decided that it was more economical for me to ditch rhythm guitar, which I knew they didn't want in the first place. So mm -hmm. I quickly got out of that. Right. End of the year, I was a rhythm guitarist. Mm -hmm. First of uh, January, I was a bass player. So there we are. So I was a bass player. And I stayed with them till, as you said, the August, August the 3rd, 1964. Mm -hmm. Having met the group in mm -hmm. Hamburg, mm -hmm. First, anyway, I met them at the beginning of 63 in Hamburg, made friends with them. They weren't a recording band. We mm -hmm. already made about six singles with the Rebel Rousers, so we were a pretty big deal. And they were unknown outside of Hamburg and Liverpool. But they were my kind of people. I liked them. Mm -hmm. And then about six months later, yeah. with whatever, you know, all that stuff that happened with the Beatles, the way was open for them to get into the studios like all the other northern groups. Mm -hmm. 
the first sec the first record was stunning, Sweets for My Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, straight to number one, my friends were international superstars. Yeah. So uh, about a year later, they weren't getting on with Tony Jackson, and they offered me the job, and boy, I was suddenly uh, where I wanted to be. Tried for years to get in the charts, no chance. There I was with the searchers. It was wonderful. And, it, and it's, you've been obviously with the searchers ever since, and still doing 150 gigs a year. But I just want to come back. You've, you know, the so searchers have been a fantastically successful band, and I know there have been some highlights of your career with them and your career is very much still going on. What, what sort of particular highlights do you remember? I, it's a question that always gets asked, and yeah. I have three that I particularly right. point out. There are loads, actually. But the mm. first highlight, the earliest highlight, was soon after I joined the band, because mm. about a few weeks later, we were going to America. My first time ever to visit America. Mm. We were going out. We were going to cross country, but the first week was to be spent mm. doing six shows a day for a whole week, at the Fox Theatre in Brooklyn. Six shows a day? Six shows a day, this was. They wow. started at 10 in the morning, they finished at 10 at night. That sounds ridiculous, but what, what happened is, that, well, first of all, I'll tell you the lineup, and this was yeah. the amazing thing. We were the big deal because anything British was best at the time. Yeah. We were the, one of the groups to follow the Beatles and get in their charts. Yeah. So it was The Searchers, Dusty Springfield, mm -hmm. Millie, mm -hmm. Marvin Gaye, The Supremes, Mm -hmm. Martha and the Vandellas, mm -hmm. Smokey and the Miracles, okay. The Temptations, mm -hmm. The Contours, mm -hmm. Little Anthony, okay. The Shangri-Las, wow. The Ronettes, um, The, the Dovells, Jay yeah. and the Americans, and wow. The New Beats. Wow. And that, as I say, was six shows a day for a whole week. Um, most of the people got to do one song. Mm -hmm. If you're a bit bigger in the uh, strata, then you got a bit more. We got three songs. Marvin got three or four. Um, Smoky and people like that, but uh, it was a. You imagine, you know, your first time in America, and you are topping the bill over people like that. It was just unbelievable. That, that's a who's who of, of it's, musical history. You really. couldn't get a bill like that anymore. I mean, yeah. Marvin would. If Marvin had been more sensible, if he'd lived a, a mm -hmm. more stable lifestyle, yeah. he would be filling arenas on his own now. Yeah, and truly, and Diana does uh, yeah. the Supremes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was my earliest. Uh, Reco superb recollection. Mm -hmm. Another one I would go to would be in 1981, mm -hmm. which was after our career had ostensibly chart-wise died, mm -hmm. that we got to do the Royal Variety Show. I, I remember you writing about that, but we'll come back to yeah. that shortly. Yeah, the, the, yeah the, mm -hmm. for the, you know, at this stage in our career, mm -hmm. And there we were being presented to the Queen at the 1981 Royal Variety Show, which was pretty stunning. And then, of course, the next one would be 1989. Mm -hmm. So, you know, although the hits had stopped, mm -hmm. the great things in our career hadn't. 1989, mm -hmm. we got to play Wembley Stadium for two days as guests of Cliff Richard on his 30th anniversary. 80,000 people on each of the two days. So, that is absolutely phenomenal. Like that. I think a few I... people came to see Cliff. <laughs> But a few people came to see the searches, I'm uh, sure. Well, I'm sure they did. We tended to get the same crowd, but yeah. uh, we weren't there Why they were there. We, we weren't the reason they were there in the first place, but it was stunning. There was no other way we could get to play to 80,000 people, you know. So thanks to Cliff. He's been a great supporter, and we've done a, quite a few things with him over the years. And he actually wrote forward one of your books, but I'm the going to come back okay. to that, if I may. <laughs> Frank, over the years you've played with different basses and you've got a, an interesting one with you here tonight. I know in the early days there are some famous pictures of you with a, a huge bass, bison bass, Burns bison mm. bass, um, but I've also seen you with a Rickenbacker recently. T yeah. Tell me about those basses and what, why you play what you well, play the, now. My first bass actually was a Gibson EBO, it's the little cherry red SG shape mm. and uh, I got that in uh, 19... Mm. 60, beginning of 1962 and I didn't get a precision because I felt the precisions were too big at the time, too big yeah. for me as a little person so I got the EBO, mm. which was a nice bass, one mm. sound and I, I couldn't play an EBO now, it wouldn't be suitable at all, but then we got kind of sponsored by Burns, who were trying to mainly because we needed a 12 string to use on when you walk in the room, so they yeah. sent a set over, mm. 
Yeah. Unfortunately, they sent a bill as well soon afterwards, which is a, <laughs> we weren't expecting. But anyway, they sent me this great big bison. That's, that's the story of British music. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, uh, this great big bison yeah. bass, which was a monster. Yeah. It's the one I took to America on that show that I was just telling you. Yeah. Big white thing, great big horns, longer neck. I don't know what scale it was. It was enormous. It looks ridiculous on me now, but it's the bass that everyone remembers. Yeah. I was in... Um, mm. New York just uh, about three three or four years ago and I went to a, a free concert in, um, in the city loads of people on it and one of the people was Mar Marshall Crenshaw who was a big um, British Invasion fan and yeah. he mentioned us in several things so he came down to say hello to me and the first thing he said to me what happened to that big bass of yours that uh, that Burns bass I said everyone remembers that yeah. it was a piece of rubbish <laughs> but it was a very memorable piece of rubbish everything rattled on it yeah. the pickups rattled them it was a bad design but there it was it's the one that people remembered I actually when I changed that over for my next bass it was the I think I part exchanged it for a Harmony Sovereign acoustic right. guitar, which I still have at home. So I don't know where it is now. I wish I'd remember the uh, the serial number because I might have been able to um, locate that one again. I, I re as awful as it may have been as a bass, I still wish I'd never got rid of it, yeah. as with everything else I've ever owned as well. Yeah. You mentioned the Rickenbacker. I mentioned, I've, I've seen you on stage with the Rickenbacker mm. recently, and, and but the bass that you've got with you now mm. is the bass that I normally see you on stage yeah. with. Um, please tell me a bit about that. Well, I'll I'm tell you about the Rickenbacker, Rickenbacker yes, first. Please. The Rickenbacker um, I bought on a 73 um, British Invasion revival tour mm -hmm. in the States. They bought it at Manny's. Incredible mm -hmm. low price in those days. Mm -hmm. And it was the last one of the initial checkered binding round. Then they mm -hmm. stopped that. I think they reintroduced it. But mm -hmm. that's become quite a collectible model because that, that was the final year. Absolutely. And it, it's, it is a beautiful base. Mm -hmm. And there are there are the thoughts that I should be using that on stage because it was a very 60s oriented mm -hmm. image mm -hmm. and it's black and white and it fits mm -hmm. with how we look on stage mm -hmm. and I would mm -hmm. it's I, I can play it but it's never a very very comfortable bass for me mm -hmm. to play because as with most other people who use that 4001 mm -hmm. they tend to take all the hardware off because it gets in the way and it yeah. got in the way for me as well mm -hmm. playing fingerstyle I needed to put my fingers where the pickup cover was, and yeah. so I removed it. But I don't like basses without the original hardware on. It okay. annoys me. I okay. want the proper look. Mm. And it also, it's a softer mm. action mm. to the one I've got now. Mm. The, well, the one I'm going to tell you about now, um, well, I will tell you about that okay. now. <laughs> I eventually, yeah. it was strange how I got this bass. It's mm. this one here, and it is a, it looks like, an early 50s yeah. precision bass. Um, it is a replica, and it was actually um, constructed by a Norwegian guitar maker called Martin Olsen. And how it came about was, we were doing a ferry in Scandinavia, and he came along to watch the show on the boat. Yeah. We got talking, I'd never met him before, he was chatting, and he said, well, I'm a guitar maker. And I was going on about guitars, as I always do, as you know. Yeah. And I was saying that, that uh, that the um, bass I always wanted was the early precision bass with the Telecaster headstock and all the other things. And um, he said, well, I'm a guitar maker. I'd love to make you a bass. Anyway, we chatted. I never thought anything about it. Mm. About two years later, I got a call from a friend of his because he didn't speak much English mm. saying that Martin has made you uh, your bass <laughs> and, and, it, and he's going to bring it over yeah. with him to the Shadow Mania show oh, right. at... Yeah. Um, at uh, Lakeside in Surrey and actually that year I wasn't going I always go I'm a friend of Bruce Welsh's and I always go yeah. and try and catch him but we were working mm -hmm. so I was going to make the show that year mm -hmm. and um, he said well we'll leave it with reception at the hotel down mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. so I went to collect it on my first day after I thought well this is great but mm -hmm. what if it's a piece of rubbish <laughs> <laughs> no. Although I, I was very fearful about how it would turn yeah, out sure. well they handed it over to me at reception. I unwrapped it in the boot of my car as soon as I got out. Mm. And it was the most beautiful thing ever. I thought, it was, this is a magnificent yeah. piece of work. Mm. And to this day, I don't know how he constructed it. Mm. Martin is a luthier. Yeah. So I don't know if he got the plain wood, constructed mm. the neck, the body, 
and everything about it. Did he get some of the parts from? Did he get some of the parts from um, Fender itself? Yeah. I don't know, because it, it all is all accurate. Mm. But he made a beautiful bass, and I can't believe that Fender would mm. make a better copy of their model than this. And the action, as opposed to the Rickenbacker, is a very percussive action. So you get um, attack and thud on it when you play on stage, and it suits me absolutely down to the ground. Apart from the fact I love the aesthetics. Yeah. The only thing he didn't bring with him was the, he didn't put the hardware on. Right. No one does these days. Mm -hmm. No one plays the hardware off. I'm mm -hmm. the other way around. Yeah. I got onto the websites in America, had it um, sent over and put it on myself, and this is how I love it. This, is, this completes the beauty of the instrument. For me. I mean, it's a fabulous-looking instrument, and this this is what I normally see you playing. But Frank, apart from this bass, you're actually a, a collector of guitars of some mm. note. And in fact, um, Lars Mullen, who's very kindly agreed to film this interview, he has actually and... photographed my collection. Yeah, and it's uh, great for me because how would I ever have got all those things in, you know, and be able to, uh, mm. you know, enjoy seeing them forever after. And <laughs> Lars, <laughs> Lars has just removed my base. <laughs> Lars, yes, Lars has. Um, he he travelled all the way up from the uh, the wilds of uh, the south yeah. and uh, photographed my whole guitar collection, which is not as big as yours, I might add. Um, but you have you've... some very fine guitars, though. Oh yeah, you? there's some good yeah. ones, and uh, it's not as quirky as yours as well. I do yeah. have some quirky ones, but I have a lot of. A lot of top of the range Gibsons and things like that, and, and my my lower range ones are really the old Hofners that we used to play in the fifties because that's all we could get. Things like Hofner committees and presidents and senators and club forties and fifties, um, and uh, now they they they're unplayable. But it was kind of buying up my childhood. I couldn't afford those instruments. I mean, I think you've got a, a box stroller bass, but what... Uh, not a bass, it's a uh, sorry, six Sorry, stroller guitar, yeah. six string, yeah. Mm. I, I knew I'd get something wrong. And, um, but what are your favourites out of your collection, mm. Frank? Mm. The box stroller, by the way, cost me £10, which is <laughs> much more than it's worth. <laughs> Actually, it's not, it's not, it is worth a lot as a curio, mm. but I mean, it's a, it's a plank with strings on. You know, it's your, your Mine cost me 150 Did it really? A box stroller? About two My years God. ago. Yeah. That tells you something. <laughs> well, um, my favourites. Mm. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, so I do have favourites, and they're all for different reasons. Mm. Uh, a pair of my favourites are two guilds, an mm. X3, Guild X350 right. and a Guild X375, which is essentially the same instrument, but the 375 denotes a blonde one, yeah. the 350 denotes a sunburst one, mm. and why I bought those instruments was because it's what Charlie Gracie came over to England with in 1957 or 58, and, uh, you know, he had the hit records with Butterfly, Wandering Eyes, 99 Ways, things like that, mm. and I just thought it was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen, and I always wanted to get hold of one of those instruments. So eventually I got hold of two of them. So They, they are fabulous, aren't they? Hmm. Just beautiful. And he still uses it today. I've let him use one of mine on a, a, a oh, show yeah. as well, yeah, because he never used to bring mm. his instruments over. Mm. He used to grab a guitar over here, yeah. like a Telecaster or something like that, which offended me so much. Mm. Seeing Charlie Gracie playing a, yeah. a, a, a Fender Telecaster. I, I can't it's not imagine on. it. <laughs> no, he's got to play a, a Guild 375 yeah. or, a, or a 350. Mm. And... Uh, yeah, so they're, they're two of my favourites. Mm. My Hofner committees, I've got a couple of those. Mm. They're favourites because, as I said, they were the sort of things millionaires bought in the 50s. I couldn't afford them. They were 90 guineas. Yes. Um, a lot of other things. I, I managed to get was in America um, a 335 12-string. Oh, right. which is quite a okay. collectible, in beautiful yeah. condition, but well, just the finish is still absolutely yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. And they are so rare because they only made them between, I think, 64 and, mm -hmm. 62 and 66 or 64 and 66. I, I should have these mm -hmm. dates in my head, but for a very short period, four-year period. I've never and, seen one. Mm -hmm. Haven't you? No. Right. Well, no. they're, they're just like a 335, okay. cherry red, but mm -hmm. with the uh, 12 strings on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's another one of my favourites. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of arch tops, the yeah. cheaper yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Antorias and things like that. I've got a beautiful Roger arch top. Uh, Ro no one remembers Rogers, but Roger was the first guitar that I Andy do. Summers had yeah. mm -hmm. in the police. And they, yeah. they've got that beautiful carved, German carved around the top, yeah. wonderfully made, mm -hmm. 
the action was absolutely unplayable. Yes. Who this, I mean, when Roger Rossmarshall set yeah. that guitar up, if yeah. he set it up, yeah. how he managed to set the strings half an inch above the fretboard, I don't know. He must have been drinking that day. <laughs> Or perhaps someone had re-angled it or something, but I had it all reset up by my guitar technique, and it is playable in a rhythm kind of way now. And Frank, apart from being a, a bass player, a multi-instrumentalist, and I, I do take issue with you on that, because you yeah. can play rhythm guitar, which is one better than me, but you're also an author too, aren't you? You, you write a piece for the Searchers website, which mm. is updated every six months, I think, yeah. and you're also the author of two very readable books actually and the sort of books that i i have to say there's the traveling man on the road with that's my first one yeah. and the searchers and me a history of yeah. the legendary 60s what happened was mm. i like writing so i decided to do some articles i'd actually yes. got some articles printed in the daily express i got three full page articles one on the, mm. the song the the story behind the song happy birthday which i right. offered to them at the time Prince William was going to become 21, mm -hmm. and then the song Unchained Melody, the story mm -hmm. behind that, yeah. when Gareth Gates was going to go to number one with it, mm -hmm. it, it I took my opportunities at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I also actually did the obituary for Tony Jackson, which is a bit of an ironic yeah. turn of fate, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. But I wanted to write more articles, and I presented one to our agent and said, could you get this place somewhere? Mm -hmm. Well, he came back to me and said, I think you should write a book, it's extremely good. So. Mm -hmm. I said, well, see what you can do. And we got a, a response from this Welsh, very small Welsh publisher who said, yes, I want to talk to you about this. We had the meeting, said, when's the book going to be ready? I said, I haven't got one, you know. Mm -hmm. Said, well, how soon can you do one? So I thought, well, they were going to give me yeah. six months. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I could write a book. So mm -hmm. I kept the first one, Travelling Man, to anecdotes about life mm -hmm. as a touring band with a lot of biography but it wasn't a complete detailed biography of the searchers it was more a book of humor as much well as much as it was about my life story or the searchers got that out is received extremely well by the fans and for all sorts of other people and they kept on saying to me when are you going to write the the proper biography of the searchers and i well i thought eventually i thought well maybe i should do this you know at least it gives me something to write about so I actually spent four years on that one, doing it properly, mm -hmm. going down to, well, going through my diaries, everything mm -hmm. that I had in my office, in my archives, mm -hmm. went down to the newspaper libraries, mm -hmm. trawled all through the, uh, the uh, microfilms and things mm -hmm. like that, and jotted down all the, uh, the important dates in our career, the tour mm -hmm. programs. I had Wendy, who runs our, mm -hmm. Wendy Burton, who runs our website, come down with me to take and down things in shorthand of what I needed mm -hmm. and to have the uh, the relevant uh, pieces of microfilm printed out. Eventually I, I just, well I just got to work and every moment I had I was typing away and mm -hmm. that was it. And I, I have to say that both books are very readable and once you start them you just, I, I wasn't able to put them down. Well thank you. And there's some wonderful stories in there, I won't necessarily spoil them all but um, there was a great story about Dusty Springfield, but maybe we'll leave that for uh, the person, who, who anybody who, who buys those books, because it, unless you want to say something... Well, about I can it. tell you the story, I can, or I can give them a teaser or yeah, whatever. a teaser would be ideal. Mm. Well, it was called the Willy Fiddling Incident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I let you say that, and yeah. It's amazing that, 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 well, it's not amazing at all, yeah. but uh, when this got mentioned mm -hmm. in... Uh, in the uh, newspaper, the mm. guy who uh, did the snippet about it obviously yeah. didn't believe a word of this story, but I promise you, every word of that story was absolutely true. Mm. And it was about the time when mm. uh, Dusty Springfield actually mm. had a quick fiddle with my willy. <laughs> okay, right. um, and it was as short as the willy, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> no, this is getting a bit near the knuckle, isn't it? But it, no, it, it, it's not salacious or anything. It was right. It was a story about Dusty actually wanted to have a child and she was figuring out how she was going to get one. Right. That's the intriguing bit. That's the taste. Of it. Go out and buy the book. It will tell you everything about it. But it is true. Mm. Frank Allen, guitar collector, author, and perhaps most famously, bass player of the Searchers, for many years, many, many years, and still doing 150 gigs a year. Thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure for me. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for asking me to be on your program. Thank you for Lars for, um, uh, well, you know, creating that uh, 
record of my archive at home of all those guitars. I thank you both because I love the enthusiasts of the genre, of the genre, and of the um, of instruments as well. And thank you for being a friend over the years. Thank you, Frank, and thank you for being a friend too. Absolute pleasure. Great. Mm.